Well, we've done a lot in the last 24 hours. Healthcare Service Corporation and Blue Cross Blue Shield announced a new center at Great Falls. That's going to be over 150 new jobs. Boeing Helena announced a major expansion, adding dozens of new jobs over in Helena, and that's just the beginning. Meanwhile, thousands of all of you have made a lot of connections, relationship building, serendipitously, um, making things happen for good paying jobs down the road. That's actually one of the main reasons of the conference. You can get together like this or out in the reception area or lot, how, in, uh, in hallways or whatnot. And I know that's working. And some of the world's best and brightest business leaders have certainly inspired us. I know they've inspired me, and I know they've inspired a lot of you. But before we get fired up and ready to go for the rest of the day, just, just a reminder of the rules. No politics. As I've often said, if anybody gets political, I'm going to cut them off of the knees. <laughs> no politics. Private sector driven. We want solutions that are private sector driven. Think big figure out how to connect, work together. It's all teamwork. And working together, clearly, we can get a lot more accomplished. I'm kind of impressed with um, all that's happened last, uh, yesterday. Basically, over 3,000 people uh, were at our conference yesterday in the, in the, here in the Hyper. We didn't have enough seats, so we had to go range for 200 more seats in the auditorium. Well, it's always good news and bad news about things. And the good news about that is those folks had air conditioning <laughs> over, <laughs> over the auditorium. Then um, I, I, a person I want to just shout out a big compliment to is um, someone you know very well, certainly all of you here at Tech, and that's Ray Rogers. Ray Rogers has been the czar of this summit. Over a year ago, we came to Ray, our office worked with tech. Ray was kind of the guy. He's the go-to guy. is to put all this together. And if, if you see a guy running around because the cables aren't in the right spot, or something's not quite perfect, it's probably Ray. And I might say yesterday, for example, we ran out of lunches. So quickly, we called somebody and somebody called Ray. And Ray uh, got the grill, tech grill fired up. So we got how was it, uh, 1,500 new lunches immediately right there on the spot. And that was Ray who did that. We're trying to run a TV cord uh, uh, through a window. Wouldn't work. So called Ray. Ray got a carpenter. We drilled a hole <laughs> and put the cable you know, through around the window. I don't know exactly what they did. But just lots of things like that. And that's Ray, Ray Rogers. I, I, Ray, I don't know if you're in the audience or not. But wherever you are, let's give a big round of applause to Ray Rogers. <laughs> Our next speaker is a really a super guy. I've known him for quite some time. Former governor of Utah. Um, I remember one time, that, uh, regrettably, a plane went down to Utah. It was a Montana uh, uh, plane, uh, trying to find the plane. and, and John said he'd work on it. He called me at like three or four in the morning when they found the plane. And I thought, my gosh, here's a guy who really works hard. He just it follows up and gets the job done. Most people would wait until the next day, but he called right away. He, when he left Utah, he had the highest rating, I think, of any previous governor in the state. He was a deputy, um, a ba deputy USTR representative, worked hard on trade, ambassador to Singapore, ambassador to China. Um, he's just and a Westerner. That's one thing I really like about John. His father's a super person. I've known his family for, for quite some time. So let's give a big, big welcome to a great guy who's going to give us little insights to how Western states can do well with respect to a, probably the Far East. John Huntsman. Okay, before bad is, um, I'll ask the first question, and then raise your hands, and, and tell us what's on your mind. Ask John what, what you think he should hear, and what, how he can help us. John, just based upon your experience, Utah governor, Western, and so forth, and, and your trade experience, got USTR, Singapore, China, et cetera, could you give us some sense of how Western states, Montana 
can take advantage of the growth in Asia, take advantage especially of, of the ascendancy of, of China's economic prowess, and given all the problems that China has internally too, but maybe that, that Montana might be in a position to help. But just thoughts on how we can look a little bit across the Pacific a little bit from a trade perspective. Anything comes to mind? Well, first of all, Max, let me tell you what a, a great honor and privilege it is to be with you. Uh, <clears throat> party politics aside, whenever people think of you, they always think of somebody who's engaged in finding opportunity for the next generation, finding jobs, expanding the economy, and I just want to congratulate you on what you've done. Because I've told you before, and I'm not running for anything, so I can just speak very honestly, there isn't a state in America that could pull off what you pulled off right here. And I mean, to get people like Alan Mulally, probably the greatest CEO in America today. And uh, I just congratulate you and everybody else involved. But let me just say this about where Montana sits, because I had the great privilege of, uh, of being governor of another Western state, which I think is truly one of the great states in America. Uh, you have it all right here. You have livability. You have an environment that speaks to growth. You have schools that are bringing up the next generation. You have the ability to do the two things that are absolutely indispensable for states to succeed. And I learned this as governor. Uh, and on these, you either succeed or you fail. And if you fail, you begin to fall behind. Number one is asking yourself the question, are you attracting brain power? Are you bringing people in to the state who can help expand your economic prospects? And if you're not bringing new talent into the state, people who find it attractive to be here, then you're losing. Because the marketplace in the United States is so fluid with a lot of talent and a lot of smart people looking to park their ideas someplace for purposes of innovation, somebody else is gonna get them. And when I ran for governor last decade, one of the most worrisome things about my state was that we were losing our college kids to other states in pursuit of other opportunities. Now that's a brain drain as far as I'm concerned. That's losing your future intellectual property and that's deadly long. So you gotta bring them back. The second part is, is your state attracting capital? Because capital is a coward and it will flee wherever it perceives there to be risk in the marketplace and it will find a safe haven somewhere else and it'll park itself. That's just the reality of the marketplace. And if your state isn't attracting capital, you're losing, and somebody else is getting it. So why do I say, I say that because the West, unlike any time, I think, in recent American economic history, is poised for growth. Because we have all of the attributes that people are looking for for the next generation of job creation. We have livability, we have affordability, we have great institutions of learning. We typically have a focus on politics and legislation that speaks to growth and not backward, and not backward policy making. And so all of that is something that Montana can take advantage of in ways that should make this a very, very exciting place. I'll tell you, just turning to Asia for a moment, and I've lived in Asia four different times. I just spent the last two months with Mary Kay and a couple of our kids living in Southeast Asia, visiting every country of the Pacific Rim. We will engage with Asia more and more for one reason. And that is, we as the largest economy in the world will export more to these countries. So the trade imbalance we see with China today, which is so mind-numbingly large, it makes people angry. But you know what's gonna happen over the next 10 years? Because I remember when we had trade imbalances with Taiwan, when I lived there 30 years ago, and Korea not so long, everybody complained about the trade imbalance, and then they corrected themselves because we started exporting more and more to markets that became open. Now, the one inexorable trend in China, although frustrating at times, is the fact that they're becoming more and more open. Not as fast as we would like, but you compare and contrast where they are to 30 years ago, and having been a China person for 30 plus years, the market is increasingly open. And what that means is with a rising consumer class, with probably the largest consumer class in the world soon to be, they will be buying more things agricultural products, innovation coming out of the United States, uh, automobiles that uh, some components will be export, exported, others will be made there, because their consumer class will want more. And that means that we will benefit from a wave of exports over the next five to 10 years that will be very good for our economies. 
So our engagement with the Asia-Pacific region, I think, will be driven in large part by our export opportunities. And our export opportunities will be driven by innovation. And that is new ideas that are plowed into the ground that only America can do. Having lived around and practically been to all the major markets. Yeah, that was what Eric business. Schmidt pointed on yesterday, innovation. He said, that's the key. That's the key. And, and, and it ain't, you know, it ain't uh, rocket science here. What do you need to innovate? You need an environment that speaks to freedom and flexibility. You've got to have uh, a system that encourages ideas to be planted in your ground, uh, an environment that speaks to a regulatory system that's, that speaks to growth, uh, and you've got to have access to capital. And you've got to have good institutions of higher learning where you can bring talent into your firms. And you've got all of it here. Okay, questions. John, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I have a question regarding your outdoor industry. Uh, Utah has amazing um, landscapes and, and places to visit, um, similar to Montana. But I'm curious what you feel like you've done to really bring visibility to that and bring people to your state to uh, partake. It's, it, it's a great question. And it, uh, it came out of a concern that we had as a state that our winter months were doing great because of skiing. And during the summer months, we were dying on the vine. And we needed to rethink the whole scenario a little more creatively. So to have the greatest vistas and venues, mountains and desert and Moab and Red Rock country, what were we missing that would allow us, if we rethought it, to capture some summer activities? And we decided in consultation with a lot of different groups, you know, outdoor biker, no, I'm a motorcycle rider, and I have been for 40 plus years, I used to race dirt bikes. I'm a mountain biker. Uh, and I also am someone who appreciates the land. So I would bring in everyone from environmental groups, you know, the, the hot, hot dog outdoor bikers. And we'd sit at a table and we'd say, okay, we're gonna talk about how we can make this state come, come to life during the summer months. And I, as governor, will help and support uh, supporting whatever it is we need. We'll rally the private sector, uh, we'll work with local governments, and we'll really put this place on the map. So as you see now, Utah has become the mountain biking destination for the whole world. We also market ourselves as the extreme sport capital of the world. Now, this was just a quirky thought of the governor at the time because I love extreme sports. And I thought, if Utah can't hit it out of the ballpark in the extreme sport category, uh, then we're not, we're not trying hard enough. And so we started attracting events. And the events brought in sporting companies. And the sporting companies would say, well, we're headquartered in Europe and it ain't so good over there. Uh, or we're headquartered in California, and we'd like to be somewhere closer to the market, but moreover in a state that is more competitive and friendly to business, and we just started picking off businesses with that focus on, uh, on making ourselves the, the outdoor sport destination. Took off, and it's worked very well, and now we can say that we are not only a winter paradise, but we're a, we're a summer paradise too. What do you do about shoulder se seasons? Because that's a problem in Montana. We've got great winter sports. Some attract a lot of tourists. In between, it's a little bit difficult for us. The in between has a lot to do with travel and tourism. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a, it's interesting, and I'll just I'll share this one with you, because it, it was probably one of the more interesting policy changes that we made. Controversial in some senses, but it was a barrier. We had really wacky liquor laws in the state. <laughs> Now, now, I say that uh, as, a, as, a, as a grandson, great-grandson of a saloon keeper in Utah. They used to run the Huntsman Saloon. So half my family were great proselytizers, the other half were great saloon keepers. Yeah. And educators. I don't know if that went hand in hand or not. Uh, and it was always worrisome to me as governor, whenever we tried to get conventions and, tra and, and, and travel tourism, People would always say, but you can't get a drink in your state. And I'd say, this is ridiculous. You know, why are we going to let this impediment ruin economic development prospects, jobs, and better support for education, which we desperately need? So we took to the legislature the one thing that I was told would never happen when I was elected governor. You'll never change the liquor laws in the state. And I thought, we'll see about that. And uh, we changed them. Great. Questions. And that brought in a whole lot more travel. That one thing put us on the map from a travel tour. Okay, all right, right here, this lady here. Back to China, I'd be interested in your thoughts on how do you balance, you know, the need for capital, and China's got a lot of capital, and the food safety issues with 
their agriculture and their food supply versus ours. And, um, and then the whole intellectual property. Um, they're less concerned about borrowing ideas without paying for them. Um, how is a, as a, as a state that's looking to export and take advantage of that, safely attract capital, protect our food supply, and our IP at the same time? They're all good and, and valid questions, and you clearly are watching the situation in China closely. With respect to access to capital, one of the big drivers of trouble in China right now, if you look at their balance sheet, is the uh, level of uh, liquidity in the marketplace. So if you, if you look at the loan to GDP ratio as compared to the liquidity uh, to GDP ratio, there's been a lot of cheap money and subsidized money floating in the marketplace. What does that mean? It means that a lot of the state-owned enterprises are waking up to balance sheets that have a whole lot more debt than they thought. It means that the provinces, of which there are 30 some odd throughout the country, some of these provinces like Sichuan are bigger than, for example, Sichuan, 120 million people, one province, than the entire country of France. So you're looking at a vast geography and they're now carrying a whole lot of debt. So China's gonna have to worry about going through what we've just been through the last eight year, years or so, deleveraging, getting debt off the books. Every family, every business, every local government, we've all been through deleveraging and it's been extremely painful in this country. But we're getting to the point where our ratios, our balances are looking better. China's now entering that period where they're gonna have to deleverage. They don't know how to deleverage. It's all been about eight, nine, 10% growth for 30 years. And now they gotta say, we've gotta cut. Well, you don't get ahead politically in China if you're a provincial leader by cutting, only by growing and adding jobs. So they're ha gonna have to rethink this whole strategy going forward. Uh, so that the access to capital question, I, I think, will be a much different uh, set of uh, policies than what we've seen in, in recent years. What China will need going forward is what we have to offer. They're going to be short on water. Uh, they're going to be short on food. Uh, I, don't, I think it's just a matter of time before, for example, the beef market opens. Uh, that's been uh, a, a rather difficult issue. But that, we're going to get beyond that at some point, and we'll see other markets that will open that will be great for our export sector. Uh, and so I say, keep your eye on the market, keep your eye on opportunity, develop relationships, state to country, university and colleges to institutions there, company to company, because we're in it for the long term. What, I'll just end with this thought. China is playing the long game, if you know what I mean. We in America play the short game whether we like it or not. In China, they're some of the best long-term strategic thinkers of the world. And they sit down at the negotiating table with the long view in mind. We sit down at the negotiating table with the short view. We're good at quarter to quarter performance, we're good at annual performance, but we don't take the long view. And that is one of the fundamental disconnects between our culture and the culture in China. And we have to reconcile that. So as governor, I tried to establish links business-wise, educationally, and culturally that we're in it for the longer term. Intellectual property protection, it's a huge problem. And I don't see us making significant gains until the local entrepreneurs of China, of which there are increasingly a lot, begin to band together as they did in Taiwan in the 1980s. I was living there at the time I watched it play out back in the days when Taiwan was an egregious violator of our intellectual property, they started making changes, even though they had laws on the books, just like China, when their local entrepreneurs said, this is now hurting us. It's hurting our reputation in the world. It's hurting our ability to reach out. It's hurting our ability to compete. I would say over the next five years, the entrepreneurial class of China, I've been to practically every province in that country, and while visiting different provinces, I always make it a point to meet with local entrepreneurs to get a sense of the energy and the dynamism that exists within this, within this country of China. They're not far from putting the kind of pressure on their government about intellectual property protection that I saw Taiwan do a generation ago and Korea do not long after that. But we have to keep, we have to keep the pressure on and we have to reach out and encourage those entrepreneurs to stand up and be bold about bringing about change in their own country. The party people aren't gonna do it. The government people aren't gonna do it until pressure is brought to bear by their own entrepreneurs. Okay. Just continuing to follow up on China. Do you think the new leadership 
campaign on corruption is uh, just for image enhancement or is an image strategy or is it a legitimate attempt to uh, correct endemic problems in their system? It's a, it's a great question. I would have to tell you that the two issues that could do in the party in China, and of course they all know this, they wake up to this reality every morning, particularly with the new fifth generation under Xi Jinping who have just taken over. One is corruption, and they're on a corruption drive now. They have a Chinese aphorism, a saying that says, you cut off, you cut the heads of the chicken off to scare the monkeys, right? We're gonna see a few high profile cases continue to play out to send the message that corruption is untenable. They're not gonna be able to root it out completely. That's an impossibility. But they're gonna show that corruption will not be accepted. Local government levels and federal government levels. The second issue is uh, wealth inequality, which is becoming extreme. So if you look on it from a, a, a Gini coefficiency standpoint, with zero being equality and one being inequality, and 0.44 being sort of the threshold where you begin to see domestic instability, China arguably today is probably at 0.6 to 0.65, which is alarming. They know that too. So these issues are gonna to have to be dealt with with the new leadership taking over now. Senator Bach is over here on your left. Okay. Yes. This issue, hi John, over here. This issue is also on China. And you mentioned early on the rise of the growing consumer class. So I think in this room represents a lot of different industries. After you leave today, I'd be curious to know how I can make connections or resources or links to try to contact some of that consumer class. Are there any references or resources you have in mind? In, in developing contacts on, on, in, within China? Yes. Let me just give you a, a real simple bit of advice that a lot of people don't know about and, and perhaps don't use. Uh, within the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, which I used to run, which is the second lar largest embassy in the world uh, after Iraq, which is big for all the wrong reasons, uh, there is a, an Office of Foreign Commercial Service. You go on your website, look up Beijing Foreign Commercial Service. There are 100 plus commercial officers there who are good, smart, skilled, engaged with the market. If you were to write them, tell them I, I, I recommended it. <laughs> and and, and see, see if you get a good response. Uh, and say, here's my business, here's my market, I'm gonna be traveling there or I'd like to be linked up with others who might be buyers of my product. Can you give me some advice? They'll turn it around and you'll hear some information you never, you never knew existed. Give it a try and it's free. I'll second that. When I take Montanans on uh, trade trips um, around the world, including Asia, I'm very impressed with the commercial section. They're, it's true, they're very bright, want to help, do a great job generally, and I, that is a good place to start. No. Yes. Wait, wait, way over there. People on the, yeah, way over. People on the, no, other way, Ben. Whoops. Okay. <laughs> I got to get people on the sides as well as the center here. Thank you. How did you balance your outdoor activities with environmental concerns? Thank you. It's a great question, and it's a practical and realistic question at that. The only way you can balance those issues is by bringing groups in, sitting around the same table, and working through the issues together. It's the only way you can do it. You've got to have a single table. You've got to have mutual respect for both sides. You have to have a listening ear. And at the end of the day, both sides have to realize that they're working for the same cause. And that's to better the state. And both sides also have to realize something that, you know, isn't always the case in Congress, that you're not going to get 100% of what you want. At some point, you're going to have to give a little bit around the edges on both sides in the name of making progress for your state, or else you fall behind. But I found that the table, the round table in the governor's office is one of the most powerful weapons in state government. Nobody will turn you down. Nobody while sitting there uh, will make a wrong decision for the state longer term. And I noticed also in a lot of states it's way underutilized. But that is how we balance the interests of both sides. And the governor can't take sides. Either. We don't have a lot of questions here. A lot, uh, do not Senator have a lot of time left. Yes, over here. Uh, ni hao. Ni hao. Uh, this, this summer I had uh, both Chinese friends and now Japanese friends visit Montana. And we have, uh, I'd be interested in your perspective on the current 
Japanese-Chinese relations, what's going on in China. Let, let me just make this one real short, <clears throat> because it's an issue that has no solution, uh, and it will continue to play out and create a little tension in the region. So if you can imagine, with the new president of Japan, a man named Shinzo Abe, second time as prime minister, he is the grandson of a wartime minister who also administered the region called Manchukuo, uh, uh, Manchuria, during Japanese occupation beginning in about 1932. So the new head of China, Xi Jinping, is the son of Xi Jinping, who was, of course, an early revolutionary hero. So the tension between China and Japan isn't just about rocks in the East China Sea called sovereignty. It's kind of a family feud of sorts, and it goes all the way back to earlier wars. Those tensions live on. So a lot of what we heard, the bellicose rhetoric about the islands, was totally expected during political season. You know, political season, you hear a lot of talk, nonsensical talk, and then you get out of the real world and it just sort of dissipates. We had leadership changes in China this last year. We had a new presidential election in Japan, and there were certain things that both sides ha had to say to rally their domestic constituencies and to be seen as being strong, never giving up on sovereignty. So I think that issue lessens in intensity, and the United States through the Seventh Fleet and Pacific Command, we have an important role to play uh, called Honest Broker. And while there is no solution because nobody's gonna give on sovereignty, uh, we have to lessen the tensions. Okay, one very trade. quick question and also a short answer. Yes. For the last couple of years, and apparently for the next few years, Western Montana and North Central Montana are experiencing what's called the Big Haul. And this is oil field equipment running up to 250 feet long that's being welded offshore, comes up the Columbia River and is being trucked through our state. One of the things that I haven't been able to figure out is Montana has welders, Montana can do precision machining, and Montana has transportation. So what, I, I'm not gonna do an autopsy of what's gone wrong. I wanna know what Montana can do to bring that here so that those processes can be done here and we can drive it across the Canadian border. That's a great point, I'll be very short here. Every state, every state is good at something. Montana can't be California. You probably don't want to be California today. Utah could never be New York. But we are states that can do some things exceedingly well, better than anybody else. You just name some things. And that means you build on your comparative and competitive advantage. And you get out to the vendors, you get out to the businesses, you tell them why they should be here instead of someplace else. And based on a good and rational business decision, chances are you've got a case to be made. Isn't he good? John Huntsman, thanks so much. Really appreciate it.